Hello and welcome to the Rogers Brief. I'm Adam Rogers. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening. Today was day 66 of the Mass Casualty Commission proceedings and uh, I'm bringing this to you a little late today. Uh, I was off to a Rotary meeting this evening after watching or listening to most of the proceedings today and uh, today actually was uh, pretty interesting. There was a discussion of sort of a new uh, way and philosophy of policing and it was uh, it was interesting from a number of angles uh, although uh, the, certainly the Mass Casualty Commission did their best to make this uh, difficult to watch at times they had well they seem to have instituted a rule which I thought was only going to apply to phase two but apparently also applies to phase three the recommendation phase which is when they bring in experts they don't ask them anything about the actual events of the mass casualty. They only ask them uh, to speak uh, broadly about their academic research. And so what you end up with is uh, a very academic discussion. And so uh, I'll talk about that. But like I said, it was interesting. It was interesting that the Mass Casualty Commission, in fact, put this on the agenda because uh, today is, uh, was talking about contemporary community policing. So, like I said, a new sort of new philosophy or thought on policing. And then tomorrow, there's going to be a roundtable talking about the structure of policing in Nova Scotia. So, it sort of implies, uh, in a way, that the commission is is looking to either uh, foster or gauge uh, public opinion for change in policing uh, in Nova Scotia. Now, uh, like I said, they're, they're talking about uh, the, the new kind of policing they're talking about. It's, it's sort of in line with uh, other new economic philosophies uh, and other things that are, are cropping up in, in medicine and other fields. And the academic study, or sorry, the economic study, uh, and I'm familiar with this through my work with uh, Engage Nova Scotia, which is instead of looking at gross domestic product, unemployment rates, and traditional uh, economic data, you look at wellness measures, uh, quality of life measures, uh, which are much more complicated, sometimes difficult to measure, but those are really what people find important in their lives. Well, so from the policing perspective, rather than looking at arrest rates, which can be very misleading one way or the other, too few arrests, and you think, well, yeah, maybe there's not a lot of crime, or maybe the police aren't arresting people. Too many arrests, well, are the police doing a great job, or are they just being overbearing and infringing on, unduly infringing on people's freedoms? So those basic statistics that we often see when we're thinking about policing, uh, don't always make sense, arrest rates, those sort of things, or police budgets, the size of the budget. You think as a political leader, well, we've put more money into policing. Well, that's not necessarily a, a good thing. It's more complicated than that. It's more nuanced. You have to think about the communities you're, you're serving and this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, everybody's, everybody's experiences before you get there. Anyway, so there's, it was an interesting uh, sort of shift. Interesting that the uh, Mass Cassidy Commission would put these on and try to get people watching if that's what they were hoping to do uh, then because these are really discussions that take us away from the traditional at least RCMP model and I'll talk about that a little more as we go along so uh, but that was just the fact that they were talking about it I thought was interesting in itself okay so uh, like I said, on the one hand, they make it they, they try to make an interesting topic. On the other hand, it's uh, you know done in this very academic, heavily academic format. So if you you know there was a lot of somebody would finish talking and then the moderator would say, well, thank you for your thank you for sharing your reflections, uh, you know, or if somebody was talking, they would say, okay, as so and so said in this paper, which commissioners I'll share with you, as if the commissioners don't have enough to read. Uh, so there was there was a lot of that and sort of self-referential and everybody was pleased to be there and they were learning too and anyway it wasn't very practical in some senses it definitely wasn't connected to the events of the mass casualty there was no reference at all to uh, those events and i presumably they were told not to speak about the mass casualty itself 
Well, I know that because uh, at first, uh, the first one of the first things that Dr. Emma Cunliffe, the uh, director of research for the Mass Casualty Commission, said was they weren't going to talk about the uh, events, which is unfortunate. But uh, that was that was their choice. Uh, now, so that what that leads to though is all of the speakers that were here, and there was a long there's a long list which I'll go through in a second. They they talk about their existing research and it's never the case that they say well i was doing this kind of research before but now i'm inspired by these events and by my observations of the response to the mass casualty events to now think this it was all pre-existing uh, agendas pre-existing research uh, from what i could see so uh, that was uh, that was what was being presented so it was yeah. This morning, uh, Dr. Cunliffe uh, did the uh, did the moderating. Uh, a gentleman named Cal Corley, a former RCMP officer, was involved in the morning. Dr. Suleiman uh, Giwa from uh, St. Thomas University in Fredericton. Uh, Chief Mark Kane uh, was down in the South Shore, I believe. Dr. Jamie Livingston from St. Mary's University. Uh, Professor Denise Martin from the. Aberte University of Scotland. Uh, it was uh, really interesting. Dr. Chris Murphy, not from Sloan, from Dalhousie and Kings, uh, retired now. Dr. Hugh Russell, a social psychologist, and Dr. Amy Siciliano. In the afternoon, there were representatives of different organizations, different participants' organizations. Uh, Haley Crichton from the Department of Justice, Nova Scotia. Don Ferris from Autumn House. Christina Fifield from Avalon Center, Dr. L. Jones from Mount St. Vincent University, uh, Mokissa Kakembo from the Elizabeth Fry Society of Mainland Nova Scotia, Inspector Curtis Kanotsky from the Department of Justice Canada, Hubert Martin from the National Police Federation, and Steve Mills from the RCMP uh, Veterans Association. So as you can see, lots of, uh, lots of people involved in the discussion. And it was uh, anyway. It was that was the uh, interesting part of the day was just the very fact that the discussion was taking place, uh, the nature of the discussion. Which, by the way, the National Police Federation agreed with the the you know this is how policing should change. Uh, a couple of the examples that they gave were interesting. So yeah, it was interesting. First of all, the National Police Federation agreed with these sort of philosophical changes. Of course, they say, well, we need more resources uh, to enact those. But uh, one, one point that was raised was the sort of diversity conformity dilemma. So the RCMP wants every officer to be the same. On the one hand, so on the one hand, they're encouraging diversity and have done a better job of, uh, at least on the superficial level, uh, having diversity in the forces. On the other hand, they the f sort of philosophy of the RCMP itself is that every officer has the same capabilities and is the same. So those two things uh, are sort of counteracting goals. Uh, and the point being made was that diversity is supposed to work best when people can be who they are, not uh, are fitted into some pre-existing uh, standard or box. The second uh, discussion, which I thought was really interesting, given that the RCMP is under scrutiny, was this issue of police legitimacy. And so it's a two-way street, is what the expert was saying. People approve and accept the police as, uh, you know, the law enforcement agency. But the flip side of that is that the police need to accept the people that they're, uh, that they're policing. And so we saw in this, uh, in the actual events of the mass casualties, some it's seeming lack of trust of the people by the police forces in not issuing the alert, in uh, you know not uh, in warning the families, not warning the public, that sort of thing. And so, uh, and being concerned with people overwhelming nine one one and all that kind of stuff. So uh, interesting if if the commissioners link that kind of expertise and that thinking to what we've been hearing in the mass casualty. Uh, hearings, then spells trouble for the RCMP. Now, when I, uh, Brenda Lucky was testifying, I, I commented at the end of it because Commissioner McDonald was sort of extolling her to be a champion of our recommendations as they emerge. And 
the recommendations that would seem to flow from today's testimony would say, well, the RCMP is incapable of regaining this trust and all this sort of thing, and we need a new kind of policing. Of course, we still need the enforcement and we need, you know, the men, you know, men and women with guns. And, uh, you know, if things are happening, they need to respond to it. But there's, uh, you know, more nuance to it and uh, a new police force may be able to start that from scratch and establish a real police force that is well respected like they are in Finland and Scotland and other places uh, rather than um, rather than the situation we're currently facing. So that was that today. Tomorrow we'll learn more about the expert thinking on police structure in Nova Scotia and the, the mix of municipal forces and RCMP and all these sorts of things and how that works. Interoperability is a word we've heard many, many times. So we'll hear more about that tomorrow, I'm sure. But uh, that's it for uh, today, day 66 of Mass Casualty Commission Proceedings. Thank you again for watching. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.